So thank you for coming to my talk. This is the hunt for Carmen Sandiego. Hopefully this will be a fun introduction uh, and just kind of a game into a little bit of uh, some of the tools around GraphQL, like GraphQL Mesh, uh, and doing a little bit of things like uh, federation if we have some extra time. So we'll be doing some schema stitching, some federation, but mostly it's going to be a fun game um, and it'll just be give us something you know fun to do in the morning. So if you want to follow along on the mirror board, you're more than welcome to. Uh, this presentation is on the mirror board. Uh, there is a PDF presentation, but that's not as much fun. Um, so if you want to go there, you can feel free to follow along. Uh, my name is Lorenzo. I am originally from Dallas, Texas. Uh, I work at Miro. Uh, I live in Berlin. So we have uh, offices in Berlin and Amsterdam. We do have some US offices, but no tech happens in the US offices. So all of it's in Amsterdam and Berlin, and a little bit of Yerevan, Yerevan Armenia. Um, and I work on the TalkTrack team. So TalkTrack was recently released uh, a, a few weeks ago. We just got our uh, product hunt. Oh, it's, it's not playing. Ah, oh, wait, there we go. There. So uh, we just released it a few weeks ago. Um, and it's basically kind of like, I mean, I can't really say the name of the product, but within Miro, where you record yourself doing things on the Miro board with a little face bubble, and then you can share that recording with other people. Um, so we call it Talk Track. Um, and so, yeah, that's just been released. Uh, so you might or might not have heard of it, but uh, it is a new feature on the Miro board, which is quite a bit of fun. And uh, it's actually really helpful, you know? So anyway, so that's enough of that. Um, let's see, there, there we go. All right, cool. So how many people remember Carmen Sandiego? Anyone? Oh yeah, oh, we've got some fans, okay. Yeah, I remember Carmen Sandiego, you know, grew up with games. Uh, I always thought they were really hard, I was a bit young, but they were super fun. You know, all of the wordplay, I felt like I was like a much smarter kid when I played them, but you know, it was fun like searching for clues and trying to find Carmen San Diego. So for a long time I've wanted to do something like this where like I can do like a, a sort of talk or workshop and then model it after something that I think would be fun as opposed to just like, you know, here's how you do these things. So this was, uh, you know, the initial idea for this. So hopefully it'll work out a little bit. Um, and so uh, as a, a sort of a recap, um, Carmen Sandiego works in an, uh, in an organization called VILE, the Villains International League of Evil. And they are international no-gooders and they, they do bad things and they steal stuff and they try to subvert world things. You know, they're just evil, right? Um, but usually Carmen Sandiego's trying to uh, sort of prove some point as a part of all of her villainous deeds. Um, and so uh, if you want to pull the GitHub, it is available here. So I'll just go to my GitHub, Lorenzo M, L-E-R-E-N-Z-O-M, slash Carmen San Diego GraphQL, um, and you can go ahead and pull the repo. So if you pull the repo, you will want to go ahead and there's two folders, one for the front end, one for the back end. Uh, well, there's not really much of a front end, but there's a back end set of things that you should not look into really because it has all the secrets, but you want to run it. And then on the front end, we'll be using uh, GraphQL queries to, you know, divine things that are in this mysterious back end land. Um, okay. So, cool. Uh, so I'm assuming all of you know what GraphQL is. Uh, does anyone not know what GraphQL is? Oh, okay, okay, cool. So we have someone who doesn't know what GraphQL is. Okay, cool. So GraphQL is a query language uh, when we talk about a graph as opposed to something like REST where everything is generally a resource. In GraphQL, we think of things on a graph and the queries that we make against the things on the graph uh, can, you know, it's a typed graph and we simply ask it uh, the different systems that are in the graph to respond with data as it's been typed, right? So it's not necessarily a given 
uh, what uh, is going to be returning that data. So long as it returns it in that exact format and that type, that's what we care most about. Whereas REST cares more about resources. Uh, you know, generally it was about like, let's go get a video, let's go get an image, let's get something like that. Uh, GraphQL is a bit more abstract, so we can sort of create these uh, types, like in this game, in this example we would have a game, uh, or we want to get messages, and it returns messages of the format of the type game that looks like this. Now which backend actually responds with this is a bit nebulous. Uh, it doesn't matter quite as much. Um, and indeed with, say, things like federation or schema stitching, you might have several different um, uh, um, APIs or services that are responding to pieces of this data, right? But from the front end standpoint or from the client standpoint, we don't care who responds with what piece of the data so long as we're able to get the full set of data, right? So it's, it's kind of a, a, a bit of a different way of looking at data. I, I actually quite like it because it's a bit more abstract. We don't care so much about where it's going as opposed to what comes back. Um, so in that sense, it's pretty opinionated, right? So uh, if we look at vile associates, you know, we might have something like their ID. We know their name, Carmen San Diego. Might know their last known location. Uh, and we know that they do things, you know. Maybe they post online or they, they buy stuff, they have activities, and they also have accomplices, right, that are other vile associates. Um, so when we create something in GraphQL, the, say the activities, which could have a post or a transaction, that is about as far as we go in GraphQL. Now the backend or whatever GraphQL server we have will be responsible for figuring out, you know, what comes back so long as it's that type which servers are going to sort of respond with this data. So that means we could have source A and source B give us both these things, and it's a bit unopinionated in this sense. Um, so this can also obviously lead to many issues, right? So once things start to get a bit more complicated, where these data sources come from actually become a much bigger problem, right? So if we look at a, a bit of a more normal example, let's say you, know, you have a customer, right? We know things about a customer like their ID, their name, their email. Uh, they have transactions, you know, and they also write reviews, right? And so we know that a review looks like this. It hits, you know, it's got an ID. There's a customer that wrote the review. Uh, it's a one to five stars, uh, and it's related to a product, right? Uh, we can get what a product is. A product has an ID. It has a name. It could have a set of reviews, uh, and it, you can sell how many of them were bought, right? And we can see what transactions are by saying it's an ID, you know, it, uh, it pertains to a product, and there's some amount of money, right? So where these things come from could actually be very different sources, right? So you know, let's say reviews come from Facebook, uh, transactions are stored in Stripe, and everything that we know about our customers and our products are actually kept in our own backend, right? So let's say we have a store, right? This would be like pretty normal, I think, as a way of like looking at this data for a store. Now. Back in the day, like I remember, I don't know, seven or eight years ago before, you know, GraphQL really took off, I would probably have to, in my backend, model all of this myself. And I would model, you know, my backend store customers. I would model the products. I'd also model the transactions. And then transactions would more or less, like, mirror what was in Stripe. But I would, like, you know, write to Stripe and then read from Stripe from time to time. Uh, but it was, like, you know, kind of annoying. And same thing with reviews. Um, so, you know, with GraphQL, it makes it easier for us to break this up into these several, these other different sources, right? Um, and from, again, from the client perspective, uh, whoever that client is, you know, it's more or less opaque. We don't really care where reviews come from. We don't really care where transactions come from, so long as they come back and they look like this, right? So we're able to break up our API into several different pieces. Um, Okay, before I keep going, that's a lot of info. Does anyone have any questions or like any comments, concerns? Am I saying anything crazy? Does this make sense? All right, cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that that's great. Okay. Um, so you know, obviously, uh, when we have a lot of these different sources then uh, it's really, really hard uh, to figure out where they're all going to go. 
Um, and so one of the, the, the solutions to figuring out this problem is coming up with the gateway, right? So instead of having everyone go to a whole bunch of different sources and that coming back with data, actually what we'll do is we'll make an API gateway. Everything goes to the API gateway. The API gateway goes to all of these different sources, brings back stuff, and sends it back to the client. Cool, that's pretty standard. Pretty nice, pretty easy. Um, and so along those lines, we have a few different tools when it comes to gateways. Um, a lot of them are, there. a lot of things are converging. They can be very similar, but we do have some somewhat distinctly different things a little bit. So we'll look at a little bit of schema stitching, what that means, and what federation means, and how they're different. Um, you know, yeah, how they're different. Um, so first let's look at schema stitching, right? So what we just talked about was basically schema stitching, where I have a generic proxy or a gateway, and it's responsible for you know, taking that request and breaking it up into smaller sub-requests, and then joining the responses back, giving it back to the final client, right? Um, this is uh, a, much, you know, a very easy way to think about uh, working with this kind of data. So we have a gateway that delegates and it, it's only re responsibility is to know about these different services, break up the responses, and return the, the responses back. Right, uh, and so you can have multiple different clients. Like one of the good things about GraphQL is you have different clients. They might ask for different things from different people, right? But the gateway's job is to sort of figure that out and then go to the appropriate um, services and bring back the appropriate data. So on a phone, you might request less data. Uh, or more specific things, let's say about a user, like if you have a friends list, you have a shortened you know, uh, set or a smaller set of data that you wanna pull back on the phone than you would on the browser, on the like, you know, desktop browser because you can show more information on the desktop browser, right? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. The gateway's job will be to sort of translate that into queries and responses. Um, but, you know, with that also comes other issues. So, like, you can imagine that sometimes these uh, APIs will break or they'll change, they evolve, right? You know, especially because, you know, one day Stripe is this and then the next day Stripe slightly changes. You know, they add something new or they take something away or they change the name of how you might call, like, a transaction amount. You know, it could be a transaction price or something the next day and that will break your API, right? So when we do something like this, we are beholden to these downstream uh, APIs, uh, and that means that we are responsible for then fixing this issue when it happens, right? So one of the ways of solving this is, uh, you know, what Federation tries to do. So what Federation tries to do is basically says, okay, it's something very similar, right? So we have a router, which is, you know, sort of like our gateway. And the router's job is the only one, you only interact with the router, and the router knows about all of the subgraphs. I call them different services, okay? Um, and the, what we say in Federation is instead of them just being distinctly different services, we'll say, okay, we have a shared schema, and you can extend that shared schema. So in this case, we'll have over here, um, you have customers, and then you have products, right? And then for transactions, transactions um, has, uh, sorry, a transaction has a product and it also has money, right? And so we need to know about product. And over here, once we get to reviews, a review has both a product and a customer. And so we need to know about the customers and the products, right? So what we say, this is kind of like, it's kind of like data modeling in a sense that like, you're, you're distilling things that are the, the least common denominator and putting this into your, your subgraphs. And then all of these other uh, graphs can sort of extend that and add more information. Um, so let's look at, oh no. Oh, I didn't have that there. I don't have any of the extends. Okay, well basically what happens is um, with federation you can take uh, uh, an, a something, so like a product for example, uh, and say you wanted to have uh, Sorry, so let's say customer. You want to have customer and extend it with reviews. What you would do is you would have the customer be the base. There we go. So the customer is the base. And over here in the review subgraph, you would extend customer and add in customer got reviews. So here you might have extend type customer reviews, right? So what the, the difference here in, in 
federation, I think of it more as like a vantage point. So in federation, it's more in schema stitching, I am responsible for the schema, I pull from several sources, yes? In federation, we share a schema, and so we start with the base, and then people can extend that base. So what you're doing in federation is it's more like you're working in a large company, and you have a shared understanding that you then want to add to, right? It's very different from I have my schema, and my schema is built from Stripe and Facebook and my backend, right? It's a very different sort of vantage point. And in my mind, that's really sort of like the main difference between, say, federation and schema stitching, right? They oftentimes look very similar because you get very similar results, but like that's really the difference is you're breaking up a big thing into smaller pieces that different teams can own when you do federation, you're federating. Uh, okay, cool. So that's enough of that, and that's like shop talk, that's no fun. And uh, let's talk about the game. Okay, so uh, again, you will want to pull up the GitHub. Um, you know, it's really fun. I know GitHub on a Tuesday morning is always my favorite thing. So um, let's see, uh, we will be using GraphQL Mesh uh, and we might also do a little bit of federation, but doubtful uh, if we have some extra time. So right now it is 10.56. So what we're going to do is pull up uh, the code and we're going to start to run our backend. Okay, so is anyone doing this? All right. Okay, so if we look here. All right, cool. So here's our project, basically. I don't know if you can see. Can you see it? No, you can't. Uh, I'm going to now mirror displays. Uh, let's see. Um, mirror there. Wow. Well, um, okay, so here's our project. If you guys will pull it up. Um, and uh, we have a back end and we have a front end, right? So the primary thing that we want to do in the back end is pull it and go ahead and Docker compose it up so that we can start all of the various services or sorry, the various uh, data stores that we have to use. Um, and once those are running, you'll be able to see them uh, using Docker desktop. So there's a whole bunch of these. So it's just a whole bunch of uh, Postgres instances. Um, I did have other data store types um, and there was a lot more excitement before yesterday. My computer crapped out and stopped working. So this is a brand new computer with a whole lot of stuff that is no longer, you know, all of my other really cool stuff is no longer here, but that's okay. So um, uh, we have these services here, and then once we start it, uh, what we're gonna be doing is going into the front end, uh, and we'll be starting from here, right? So we're gonna be using GraphQL Mesh um, in order to talk to the various services that are in our backend. So, oh yeah, the other thing we wanna do is first go ahead and start uh, services HQ. So you go and install this package here and then start HQ because that's our main backend that we talk to. Um, okay. So, and then once we come back to the front end, uh, we would be running um, GraphQL Mesh. So it's long one, front end, yeah. Uh, we don't want that. Maybe this one. So, mesh. Has anyone used GraphQL Mesh before? No? Well, it is really, really fun. 
Um, okay, so I'll give you a little bit of a, a primer on GraphQL Mesh. And I'm assuming you've used at least the GraphQL Playground, or maybe you haven't, actually, so some of you have not. So one of the cool things about GraphQL Mesh is, uh, so if we create a, um, you know, our MeshRC YAML, what it does for us is it, uh, we basically turn it on and point it to a data source, and it will auto-generate a GraphQL API for us, which is amazing. So you can point it at um, basically everything on the planet. Um, so it can work with GraphQL, OpenAPI, gRPC, JSON, Postgres, uh, MySQL, Neo4j, Thrift, Mongo, SOAP. Um, yeah, I guess that's everything. I've tried, I've definitely tried all of these. So OpenAPI obviously works. Uh, gRPC works really well. It doesn't work so well on the playground because the same issues with, uh, say, gRPC curl happen where it doesn't show streams until you've ended them but it can read from a gRPC stream and convert that into web, um, uh, either web sockets or service and defense. Um, it can work with Postgres, uh, which we'll look at in a little bit. It can you know, read Mongo, and what I mean by this is like you point it to a, like give it the connection string and it will auto-generate a Fluent API. If you've ever done, let's say, Spring Boot, where it might use, if you use Spring Data and it will auto-generate a REST API out of your you know, backend or out of your data store, this does the same thing, but for GraphQL, right? So let's look a little bit about that. Look a little bit at that. Um, and so, if we look at this, um, so what we've gotten out of this so far is we do have. Not going to use that. We have a query. Uh, actually, no, there. It's probably what it is. So we can um, we point it to our GraphQL. Um, uh, API. So this is an actual GraphQL API. So we could also just use the pl playground and point it to this and get the same thing. But the point here is this will connect to it, uh, read from the schema, and auto-generate what are all of your queries, mutations, subscriptions, things like that, right? So if I wanted to use that API and query, uh, let's say Vile Associates, you know, and I want to, the good thing about GraphQL is since it's typed, uh, I can you know, automatically get a whole bunch of uh, completion for myself. And so this is what I'll have, right? So this is reading from the backend uh, GraphQL API. So that API just, it's like a REST API, but it does this, right? So it also allows me to look up uh, an associate by ID, which in this case is their name. Um, and then we get some information about them. So, um, at this point, we would, you know, start the game, and uh, I actually had this really, really wonderful, um, let's see, uh, let's see, uh, I had this really wonderful uh, messaging system set up before my computer died yesterday. So I will have to, instead of you getting like automatic messages that give you clues, I'm actually just going to read them out loud in my really fun, Fun voice, I guess. We'll see. We'll see. You know, I'm not an actor, but I guess this is my my debut. Okay, so you start the game, and you're able to connect to HQ, right? Where's my chain? There we go. All right. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Agent, we have a situation. Three heads of intelligence are pointing to something big in the underbelly of New York. The NYPD is chasing ghosts after a series of art heists. We've got to dig deeper. These aren't just ordinary smash and grabs. The Museum of Modern Art has given us restricted access to their digital archives. There's more to these art pieces than meets the eye. Meanwhile, Wall Street's acting sketchy. Our contact in a small investment firm sent us an encrypted file that's too hot to handle publicly. And speaking of money trails, Empty Pockets is back on the grid. You won't believe this. But the IRS and Swiss Bank uh, are giving us conflicting reports about his transactions. We even picked up some crypto chatter linked to his alias. You're going to have to multitask, agent. The clock is ticking. And I don't have to tell you what's at stake. Godspeed. OK. So that's what you would get if you were playing the game. And uh, <laughs> uh, it would also give you the link to a few data sources that you can add. Right. 
So this is where we start to add other data sources and look through them. And the goal of this game is to like pull in these various strands of data sources, put them together into something cohesive and sort of help solve uh, the mystery, right? So if we want to add in a new uh, Postgres, so we have two Postgres instances, right? So if we were to go to GraphQL Mesh, Postgres, we'll use PostgraphVile, so you would wanna install this, this is already there for you, and you add in a source that's like this. So I mean, I think this is actually what's super fun about GraphQL Mesh, is that like, uh, which one was this one? Let's see, this is Bank of New York. Bank of New York, right? So it's Postgraph file. There we go. And the API string is this. Okay. So this is like a standard connection string that you would use otherwise, like in your regular backend or in your tools to look through uh, a database. Um, and Postgraph file. Uh, actually introspects the database and then auto-generates um, a GraphQL API for you. So if we take this and then restart, and we look at our data sources, what we get is a whole lot more things, right? So um, this one is a bit hard to read. Let me see if I have, there is a, and plugins, and I want to say it's like at graph file contrib. At, I might have it here. Hold on. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, oh, you're looking here. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. Um, there is a really nice graph file. Uh, inflection, this one, simplify inflector. So these can also take in um, plugins. And what this one does, so I also want to install this. Um, so I go to front end, open in terminal, npm i that, okay, cool. Bam. All right, so let's go back to what's running and I'll restart it. So this will make it easier to understand or to, to view. So if we look at this, this actually simplified it quite a bit. If we look at the old one, it, it's very uh, verbose in terms of its output, but we can simplify how it looks. And then also in a lot of uh, this configuration, we can simplify which things actually show up in our API. But basically you can take a GraphQL like instance and then just auto-generate a GraphQL API from it. Um, okay, so what we have are uh, available to us are Vile Associates and we also have transactions, right? So let's look at transactions. Um, and you could you can think of this just like how you would like search in, in uh, Postgres uh, using a console. A lot of it is very, very similar, right? So let's say I wanna look at all of the transactions, right? And we know, let's say like total count, Right, and from each of them, that's what they call the nodes. We want the amount, we want the sender, the receiver, and let's say the date, right? Um, do something like that. Um, oh no, well, I'm gonna leave that for now. Um, okay, cool. So we could see um, basically all of the things that are in the database. If we were to look at this database separately, we would have the same thing. So let's go to, where is it, where is it? Uh, this was before, yeah, NYC. Um, from transactions, I know, limit 20, right? And this data is what we're seeing over here. Um, but we have a sort of fluent API. So with transactions, let's say actually let's use a builder because this is really fun. If you guys have never done this before, this is really, really cool. Um, okay, so I have, let's say transactions and I want to take the first 20 
Um, and let's say uh, I want to add in the total count. I want the amount, the ID, the note receiver sender. And this will build it for me. And then, oh no. Okay, I've been doing it wrong. But there we go. So this builds uh, this for me, right? Um, and so what we want here to figure out is, so we know from the clues, right, that we're looking for someone uh, named Empty Pockets. And another thing that we can do is we can go back to Vial Associates uh, and let's get their names, right? So like ID, personal info. Um, okay, so we have some of these people that we can look through. So Empty Pockets is one of them. So we're going to query transactions, um, condition, let's, this might be a complicated, so we want receiver is this. Uh, let's see, receiver is empty pockets. Yeah, let's try this one. Uh, so I did something wrong with this, but okay. Okay, so we do have some transactions for empty pockets from uh, Carmen San Diego. Do we have any where he's the sender? Oh, we do actually. Okay, so we have quite a few transactions in the Bank of New York from Empty Pockets. So this would uh, help us figure out a more in terms of our investigation. Um, and so, uh, let's see. Um, we also were given access to the MoMA catalog, right? So we got this one. Let's look at MoMA. Okay. Okay. So let's add another one. Does this make sense to you guys, or am I going? Am I going too fast? Am I saying a lot of craziness? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that was uh, my mistake. If you go to backend services, it's in HQ. Uh, so go to backend services HQ, and that's the package JSON. Wait, this uh, this one, right? Here. It's in backend, uh, backend services HQ, this package JSON. So, which one? Uh, so there's front end HQ and there's back end. Did something happen? No. So if you just go here and then do npm install inside this folder, what happens? Uh, it, it works? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So just go go into this folder and then do npm install. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot in there. Um, yeah, I, if I were better about this, I probably would have just done a workspaces thing. That way a single install would have fixed a lot of stuff, but yeah. Um, okay, so once that's working, let me know. And for the moment, what I'll do is keep going. So we were also given access to the MoMA collections, right? Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. So my, my really awesome clue system uh, is not a part of this anymore because my computer broke down yesterday. I had this like live clue system that you would log into and it's, but my computer broke down yesterday, and so it's still not working. So this is a different computer. So yeah. Uh, so I'm just reading these out loud instead of, you know, usually this connect to HQ would have worked, and you would have actually gotten the clues in real time. So there was actually a subscription here, which is like uh, connect to HQ. 
uh, and this actually worked and would feed you clues every few minutes, um, but that's not working right now. So I'm just doing this in person. So, um, are you on the mirror board? I can add this to the mirror board. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, cool. Uh, eighteen point eighteen point eight. I didn't leave an NBM. Okay, okay. Let's see. Let me stop presenting. Okay, so I'll go down here. There we go. Clue number one. Okay. Right. So, yeah, so this is your, uh, these are the first two uh, URLs that you get for the um, Postgres instances. Okay, so let's add in the second one, which is MoMA. And they give us some of the collections that were stolen. So, uh, now if we, we've set this here, and if we restart our server, we will see a bit more. So now we can see artworks, and artworks list, in addition to transactions and transactions list. All right, so let's do, just do a quick query of like artworks and see what they have. Um, and what we have are, let's say, total count. And then what is it, nodes? So this is what's auto-generated from Postgres file. So artist name, history, origin, creation date, and see that. I think I still have, okay. Um, okay, so we have some ancient maps. We have a Vincent Van Gogh, Starry Night, alternate reality, believed to be one of Van Gogh's alternate interpretations of the night, of the night sky over saint rémy de provence um, The Chalice of the Eternal Echoes, a jewel-encrusted goblet believed to have been a prized possession of the obscure medieval sorcerer. So a lot of this is actually generated by ChatGPT. I had a really good time. Uh, doing this with ChatGPT, uh, I have a months-long conversation where he, <laughs> where it generates a lot of stuff for me. I put it all in here. It's really fun. So uh, yeah. So there's also, yeah. Anyway, so here's some stuff that we know that uh, could be missing. So with these two things, we have a little bit of extra data. So there's um, one thing I would want. Actually, let's just keep going. Um, so it's about 11.20. Uh, before we go on to the next few clues, uh, let me stop there. And, you know, so I haven't actually gone too much into, like, the investigation part of the clues. I've just shown you how to put these things together. Does it make sense? Yes. Yes. Oh, the query. Oh, okay, here we go. Here, yeah. Um... Yeah, actually, if you use the playground, it will auto-complete for you because it's typed. So, you you know, if you just, my go-to is to use all the vowels and then it will tell me everything. So I just go A-E-I-O-U and then I, I've hit every word that's possible. <laughs> that's how I do auto-completion, but, you know. Um, okay, yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. So uh, it's a part of the MoMA collections, right? So if we look at this database, it has only four, it only has these four things, right? But these, these Docker containers that you started up at the very beginning, these are all the databases that basically are part of the game, right? Um, and this, uh, so what's interesting about this tool, right, is like I gave it no information. I pointed it to a database, and it, it figured out the data types. It figured out the name of the table, the schema. It auto-generated queries, right? So like I can query 
you know, select all from artworks where, you know, name is blah or something, right? It gives us all of these things, which we sort of looked at a little bit here when we looked at transactions. Like, this is auto-generated, right? I didn't make any of this. It generates this for me, which is, like, really, really cool. Um, and, uh, every time you start, it will regenerate, right? So, yeah, every time you restart the server, yeah. So if you were to change the schema, you would want to restart it, right? Um, if you were doing this in production, then what you would really do probably is uh, it has tools to generate a schema file, like a GraphQL schema, right? So you would run it in CI, for example, or as a part of a pull request, you would generate that new schema or the updated schema, and then check that in. Right, and then it will use that um, when you're like writing your code, right? So, but for dev, it's really easy to just auto-generate it when you start the server. Um, yeah. How cool. Long does it take to fill up that queue if I give it a lot of data, lot of data? Um, It's more or less. It's about the same as a select query. Like this turns in just and turns into a, a select query, like a general query, right? So it does the same with mutations to so like you know update or insert blah blah blah. It also has subscriptions. I've not actually gotten, I've never actually used those where it will read from the wall logs um, and also give you a subscription of things that were inserted or created or updated or whatever. So, I mean, in theory, you can also use that, but it basically turns into just a simple SQL query. So as, however long that takes is how long this would take. It does have some optimizations around things like N plus ones and stuff. Um, so in theory, it's supposed to be really, really good. I haven't gone too deeply into that, but it does actually have ways of, say, optimizing, you know, those types of queries. Uh, you can you can you can set like defaults or config like how long you want to wait before it ends, right? So I think the default is like ten seconds or something. Uh, but I think there's a config. You can just add the config and change that. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 this is not federation yet, no. This is just, this is what I would call schema sketching, right, where we pull in a whole bunch of different things, um, and then we've created a schema out of those different things, right? Right, you know, like, uh, we've seen this under, uh, there is some, some other, okay. Oh, no, no, these are actually um, columns in the table. So if we... Yeah, well, the, uh, well, no, 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 the, um, they're just the same because I made them the same. So the, the column is sender and receiver, right? And then, I mean, that's just transactions for this. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I, I didn't do, like, I didn't do actual UUIDs for this. I just did string name is ID. So, like, the vial, like, ID is their name because I was just, it was too much work to actually use, like, real IDs. I want it to be fun not hard, so. <laughs> but yeah, in, 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 in reality, what you do is use the actual IDs, right, and then um, use those uh, to help do federation or other things. So if you wanted to, say, have a key field, which is like their ID, which would be their UUID or something like that, that could be used to help pull in, you know, let's say, joined data. So if a user had posts or if a user had reviews or something, you could get reviews by user ID, and then that would automatically turn into that, right? So does that make sense? Does that answer your question? In this case, this is really simple. I didn't do anything special here. In the real world, yes, you would probably do something like that. Yeah. Yes. Ah, right, right, exactly, exactly. So for you, um, you want to add in the other things from the clues, uh, which is, oh, it's okay, this is fun, this is fun. Uh, so, you know, add in, right now all you have in your mesh RC YAML file is this, original source, and, oop, there. And you wanna add in these other sources. So, uh, when I was talking about the clues where we got a Postgres um, uh, connection string, in order to bring those into our GraphQL schema, we use uh, these source handlers in GraphQL mesh. Oh, oh yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you on the, actually, are you on the mirror board? I can just put this there. <laughs> that's, that's like far easier. Yeah. Um, okay. 
here. Here, so there. I'll put that there, and then you can go and copy it from there. Yes. The the mirror board? Yeah, okay. It is. Uh, yeah. So you can use your phone. Hit. Yes. Do you need to what? Uh, no, 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 no. You can just leave those running. Yeah, we they, we're not like uh, part of this. Is, uh, yeah, there's no like mutations of the data in the Docker containers that we worry about. Just start them and then it's fine. Yeah. The server, yeah, the 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 front end server, exactly, exactly, and then it will regenerate the schema itself. Um. Uh, da, da. Okay. So, all right. So, are you guys ready to go on to the next clue? We'll do a little bit more, and then we'll just stop, and then you guys can ask me questions or something. Right. You ready? Okay. Uh, I'll try my my best voice. Let's see. Let's see. Where'd it go? Here we go. Uh, okay. Um, okay. The underground auction, also known by the socialites of London as the Midnight Masquerade, was no ordinary event. Nestled beneath the historic streets of London, this auction drew the attention of the world's wealthiest and most influential. While the public perceived it as a gala of masks, ball gowns, and champagne, Beneath this veneer lay a darker purpose, a black market of stolen, a, a black market trade of stolen treasures. Rumor of the event first caught the ears of MI6 when undercover agents noticed increased chatter on local student tech forums. There were whispers of an encrypted bidding system being developed by a prodigious, prodigious hacker from a top tech university. While the details were sparse, the buzzwords untraceable transactions and anonymous bidders were frequently tossed around. Simultaneously, London's high society was abuzz with excitement. Social media platforms and elite chat groups hinted at a once-in-a-lifetime event, a masquerade where identities were hidden, but ambitions were clear. To MI6, the coincidence was too great to ignore. Okay, and then with that, you would get your next set of clues. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So uh, at this stage, we have access to three new data sources. And so we would add these in, uh, where we have socialite media, and then a student tech forum, and uh, Bank of London. Uh, so I'll briefly add these in here, and then we'll just look through them for a bit, and then call it a day. OK, so. Da, da, da. Okay, so first one is socialite media. Second one is tech forum. Third one is Bank of London. Okay. Okay, so socialite media is this. So likewise, you could do this with Postgres, you can do this with uh, REST, you know, so long as it has uh, open API, an open API schema or a Swagger schema that's available. You can do this with Mongo. Uh, Mongo's a little bit harder, but you can do the same thing, where you basically give it whatever connection string or point it to something that's got a schema, and it will auto-generate this for you. Right, so then once we've added these, we would restart, and then we can go and look at the data that we have. Um, okay, so one thing that's really, really useful here is uh, the encapsulate, uh, encapsulate uh, GraphQL mesh, the encapsulate transform. Let's see, um, let me go ahead and install this and I'll show you how it works. Um, let's see if I can remember, because it has a little bit of special rules. 
Wait, is it this one? No. I want it in. Huh? Okay. There. So encapsulate. So encapsulate is really nice because what it'll do is it will take uh, these things that have been added to our schema and just encapsulate them. So just namespace them, basically. Uh, which is really helpful once we have a whole lot of different things um, that are all like very similar and whatnot. But it's not like super important. It is just nice. Um, so I, I would add one of these. I would add this on. Um, okay, cool. So let's see what we have are, oh, this actually might be a problem here. This, that's interesting. Oh, this actually might be a problem. Uh, so, huh. Um, count. Um, nodes. So we have a count name. We have the post. Let's see the date. Uh huh. Okay. So interesting. Okay. Oh wow. Okay. So there's actually a good reason we want to use encapsulate. Um. So let's take out socialite media for a second. And I will tell you why I did that. Okay, so let's go back to this query that I had. Looked at posts, so these are from the tech forum. So um, these are tech student, like posts on their you know, forum website. Um, and we can see, you know, some things that they have been writing. So the SMT application is down. Connect the virtual microchip so we can generate the EXE matrix. Um, I think these are fun. Try to reboot the RSS bandwidth. Maybe it'll generate the multi-byte interface. ASCII. Nonsense, basically. <laughs> um, but uh, there are actually a few uh, um, important clues in here. Um, so what we would want to do here is search in the posts for the keywords that we were looking for, which are things like, um, you know, Midnight Masquerade and whatnot. So if we wanted to build this query, I would go over here and just use the query builder and I would do posts where posts, and I think they have something, let's say Midnight um, and then let's go ahead and get the post and the account name to it. Yeah, I don't, um, uh, midnight, no, I don't think it'll work. Um, yeah, I don't think that'll work. Well, I guess we'd have to just look at all of them then. Oh, that's okay. Total count. And then oh, it's post uh, count name. So what's interesting in what what's interesting in this problem here actually is when I cre originally created these. So uh, socialite media and the tech forum have the same schema, um, which is a problem that you would have here. Where if we look at uh, so here's tech forum. Um, I'll try and zoom in here. Okay, so, you know, we have the accounts, we have posts, right, um, and we have the date, and if I wanted to search normally with SQL, I would just, like, look, you know, oh, um, select star from posts, where post, I don't know, what, what is the, it's not I like, uh, that'll be exact, um, includes, I don't remember what includes is. Um, uh, what is includes? Whatever. Who cares? Yeah. But we would want to build some. There, there, there's ways of doing special querying in this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there's some kind of plugins that you have to put in, like either convert them to a string or do something like that. So that was uh, my 
Yeah, I, I didn't put that into this workshop, but what you would do normally is go to scalars. There's GraphQL scalars that you can add on, uh, which are these types. It, it just can't understand uh, UUID, but if you were to tell it to be a string, it would be fine. But uh, these, there, there are, exist a whole bunch of scalars, which are these like primitive types that you would have in your schema, which would be like date time or UUID. And then it can also use that to sort of like um, uh, validate types that come into your API, right? But right now it only has the basic ones, so I would actually have to change this to string for it to work properly. So I would say just ignore those and don't, don't pull those properties. So don't, don't query for an ID and then it'll be fine. <laughs> But yeah, that's an oversight on my part. Um, okay, cool. So anyway, what I was saying is, uh, so Tech Forum and the Socialite Media actually have the exact same schema. They're both called posts, and they both have the same properties, which creates an interesting problem when you put them into the same schema because it doesn't know necessarily how to separate them. So encapsulation is one way, one way to get around this problem uh, where you do namespacing basically, so you say, you know, socialitemedia.posts, right, or techform.posts, um, or you can live with them being in the same namespace, which would probably be fine, unless you really care about them being separate, but, I mean, you probably do. But if you don't, then uh, that's totally fine, because they have to have an ID, like a node ID, that is unique. So long as they're unique, it's fine. Uh, and they all have a UUID as an ID, so it actually works out fine. Um, but yeah. Uh, querying both. Oh yeah, yeah. So this, uh, I did that before. I turned it off. Let's see. So I turned. What am I looking at here? So socialite media. So I turn off. I turn this back on. Let's go back to this query. Let's take this out. Um, and it works perfectly fine. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, hold on. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So when we first did this, you can see some of them have like emojis and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yes, yes. Hold on, let me see. Posts. Right, did something, or I'm doing, looking at the wrong thing. Okay, socialite media. Let me see. It was showing up in the first one. I probably, I must have done something. Uh, okay, let's see, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. So if we do this, okay, here. And then let's look at the total count. It's 14, okay. Let's put this back on. Call this again, 331. They're probably in. Let's take out this one. Oh, I'm wrong. Huh, so what happened? Well, this is actually a great mystery. Anyway, you probably don't want to do this. You, you want to namespace them, so I don't know exactly what happens in this case. Um, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this tool that I was talking about, Encapsulate, this transform, what it does is it namespaces. So what you do is you put it on, and you basically just turn that on, and it'll apply to everything. 
and it'll go from, you know, what we had was like posts, I think. It's like posts in my query. And then I would, it would be like socialite media dot posts, you know, socialite media and then posts, right, in my query. So, yeah. It does, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you just use this and then add this transform into um, the, the, whole, the whole schema, so you'd have it global, and it would do that for you. Yeah, so I, I normally I do this myself when I'm when I was playing this game. Um, actually, let me see if I can just turn it on. I, I remember there are some extra issues around using it with PostGraph file that I had to look up, and I don't have those um, blurbs anymore, so I know it won't work off the bo uh, out the box. There's like a little bit of extra that you have to add on to get the node ID or something there. Anyway, but yeah, tools like this are helpful. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, does anyone have any questions? You probably have, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it'll come back in the same encapsulated form. So the response would be like socialite media and then like posts and then the list of them. So it, it always comes back in exactly the same format that you put this in. If you look, huh? The, the, the types are always correct. They're always the same types. All it does is namespace. So yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I think encapsulation is probably the most useful one. I, I use it basically all the time for these things. Uh, like for federation, it might be a little bit more not as useful. We didn't really go too much into federation because in federation you want everything to be available so you can have the shared types. So if they're encapsulated, they're not really shared types. So it becomes a little bit harder. But anyway, any other questions? Okay. Well, yeah. So we didn't get to do too much of the game, game itself. But I think that's okay because I think a lot of this was you know, exploratory and learning. And also, the clues are really hard. Not gonna lie, ChatGPT did a really great job of creating a very, very large story. Um, is it this one? Uh, let's see. What is this here? Uh, unhide. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I will leave it public forever because I have no reason not to. <laughs> um, ooh, it won't let me unhide. Oh well, well, oh that's lame. Um, I must have some other tab open. Whatever. Okay, well, I had a mermaid diagram of the whole story. It's behind this hidden tab, which is really exciting. It's, it's like the whole thing happens in multiple stages, basically. Uh, I'll just give you the story. So uh, they steal some, uh, so first they um, steal items from the MoMA, and then they take those items to, uh, these are vile associates, they take them to London and do an underground auction, or a secret auction, where they sell them off in order to raise funds. Uh, and they work with a hacktivist collective uh, to subvert the oil and gas industry. This was part of ChatGPT's very elaborate scheme. I just like let it go crazy, and it came up with like dozens of characters, like all of these items that were sold and like backstories of all the items and how they were connected to like students at the engineering college in London and like blah, blah, blah. It was, it was really fun. So uh, yeah, if you do get a chance, you can go through all of the, the clues and stuff and like play around with it. It's really fun. And then of course at the end, you're supposed to be able to uh, figure out who is the person who's most likely to uh, turn you know, so that you can like question that person and then get all of the digital artifacts and all the evidence. Cool. Well, 
thank you all. Hopefully that wasn't too, too boring. Hopefully it was fun. Hopefully you learned something. Um, yeah. Well, thank you all.